here. Okay, great. So it is my great, great pleasure to introduce you to Julia Lane. Uh, she is a professor at the NYU Warner Graduate School of Public Service, the NYU Center for Urban Science and Progress, and a provostial fellow of, and a provostial fellow for innovation analytics. She co-founded the Color uh, Color Rich Initiative. We had a presentation about that on Monday, uh, and the goal of that institution is to use data to transform the way governments access and use data for social good through training programs, research projects, and a secure data facility. The, the approach is attracting national attention, including the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy and the Federal Data Strategy. Uh, Julia has been a fellow for the American Statistical Association since 2009. She's also a fellow of the Society for Economic Measurement and the American Association for the Advancement of Science and an elected member of the Inst International Statistical Institute. Julia has been awarded many, many uh, grants, uh, and uh, it's a real pleasure to have her here <laughs> with us today. So please join me in, in uh, welcoming Julia. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I, I want to really congratulate uh, uh, Dan, Daniel, for uh, doing such a great uh, gift to the science of science community. I, I am going to ask you all to turn on your pictures. I, uh, if I could, if you could go off, go on camera, I'd very much appreciate it. Um, and, and normally what I would do is uh, ask each one of you to say a little bit about what you are interested in learning from me. Um, but in, because we've only got 30 minutes, I'd like you just to put in the chat uh, kind of who you are and, um, and, and what your interests are for, for, the, for the science of science. And um, then I'll be able to kind of tie that in a little bit with the conversation. So, so uh, to just you know, put in your name and uh, your institution, uh, where you are in your degree, and uh, what you want to learn. So I'll also, uh, Daniel, if that's okay, I'll, I'll keep that chat if you'll send it to me afterwards. Uh, so that if you want to reach out to me and if you have any questions, uh, I can I can answer them. So so let me leave you for a second. And those who've just come, if you'd turn on your if you'd go on camera, I'd very much appreciate it. Let me leave it for a, a second as you're thinking through things in the chat. Hey Matt. <laughs> um, so. So, so I am a I'm a labor economist by training, and uh, I actually got into the science of science uh, very uh, kind of midway through my career. I what I don't know if you know how this kind of started, but essentially what happened was the um, former um, White House science advisor, uh, whose name was Jack Marburger came in and he, back then, the, he was director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And he essentially um, said, you know, we don't, there is no science of science. All we do is come in and say, send money. R&D is important. You should invest in it. And he said, in the other areas of uh, policy, like education policy, labor policy, and so on, you've actually got data, you've got a theory of change, you've got evidence, and that's much more compelling like than stories like just uh, send money and we'll put a man on the moon or, you know, send money and, and a miracle will happen. So um, what NSF did and this is the program that you're funded under, was set up a science of science policy program. And Kay Husband's feeling at, you know, at Georgia Tech now uh, was the inaugural program officer and I was the second. So I came in and uh, again, what I was interested in was understanding uh, what were the micro foundations, what were the behavioral constructs 
that uh, that created science. You can't just treat it as a slot machine. And uh, while a lot of the bibliometrics is, is quite interesting, really documents do not produce science. So what produces science? I'm going to pick on people. So Li Shen, Liang. By uh, any form of communication between uh, members in the any specific scientific community. That's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, notice what he was talking about is people. Right? So science is produced by people. It's work. So it's people working together to produce ideas. If you go and take a look at uh, the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics and take a look at a guy called Paul Romer, R-O-M-E-R, he got the Nobel Prize for noting that economic growth occurred because of investments in technology. It's called endogenous technological change. And the key insight was that while Previously, a lot of economic growth occurred by investment in the production of goods. Goods are what's called a rival product. So when people uh, produce something, if I eat something or, or um, uh, wear clothes, no one else can wear them. The thing with ideas is that when you share them, it's not diminished. So the communication of ideas, the production of ideas, and the communication of those ideas is the source of a great deal of economic growth because that's scalable. So what I wanted to do when I came in and I took a look at the state of data for science and evidence and science policy, the study of documents wasn't the appropriate unit of analysis. It had to be the study of people. Now we didn't have data on people. So that's what we started to build was an infrastructure around people. And so I'm going to tell that story and I'm going to now jump into the slides. So does that make sense? Uh, Osgur, I'm probably butchering your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Elena, oh, are you good? Yes. Okay, great. So, I, and just for pre-warning, I'm going to stop from time to time and, and ask you, right? So, Ankita, Eric, uh, if you'd put your uh, uh, pictures on, if you'd go on camera, I will pick on people who don't have their pictures on, on camera. So, Soda, Lucas, I will be picking on you as well. And Daniel's smiling. This is a, a well-known uh, activity. So, uh, Sylvia, please please put your things on, or you are guaranteed to be the first person that I pick on, and people who are looking away from the camera as well. Okay. So, he, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about the data and the evidence for the science of science, and I'm going to talk through, at Daniel's request, a uh, a paper that I did in Nature uh, that was published uh, about four or five weeks ago. So Sylvia, have you seen that paper? Has Daniel talked about that? How about soda? I'm um, sorry, can you repeat the question? I was hey. <laughs> okay, uh, so has Daniel talked about the, uh, can you go off camera, on camera if you would? Uh, no, I was writing that second because I have people around me, but... Uh... Oh, I see. Okay. So, so has Daniel talked about the, the nature paper? Uh, have you seen the paper? Uh, uh, no. I, uh, okay. Well, you're going to, you're going to learn about it now uh, because uh, what I, what we were interested in was describing the science of science. So what I want to know and what the data infrastructure that I'm going to talk about is going to talk about how do we capture information about the people who are doing science. Now, Lucas, um, who does the work, do you think, 
in producing science? Is it the principal investigators who do all the work? Eric? Okay, neither of them are on. So Ankita. Who does the work of producing science? Is it the principal investigators? Is it people I like... A, I think it is a team building effort. It is done by all the people that are involved in science. Exactly. It's graduate students, it's postdocs, it's clinicians and so on. Who shows up as authors? on the publications. Mimi? I guess PIs primarily and then students, anyone who contributed. Great answer. Okay, so now we're gonna go through and we're gonna see if that's right, okay? So um, I'm gonna whip through the very beginning, which is the key insight that we had was, you know, as I said before, we've kind of had this view of put money in, then a miracle happens and we get great science, okay? So if you, any of you are baseball fans, you'll recognize uh, not just Brad Pitt, but uh, also that the way in which, uh, you know, Oakland A's are not very good now, but uh, the back in the day, they use data and evidence to put together a team, right? Uh, that would produce baseball better. Now imagine, instead of just saying, send money and a miracle happens, you, put, you thought about putting together teams that produce science better. Does that make sense? So how are we going to do that? Well, when I came in in 20, no, when was it, 2008, 2009, uh, the uh, White House committee that I co-chaired essentially went to see what kind of data we had to inform the science of science and the interagency group found the data infrastructure is inadequate. So we, we didn't have the data to understand what was going on. But back when NSF was established, I said the first step, if we're gonna have a science of science policy, we have gotta figure out what the relevant data are. So let me tell you what not to do. This is the, the original Jack Marburger uh, editorial in science where, you know, you need data to answer questions like this. Um, how much should we spend? Is it, does it matter which kind of science we spend money on? Does it matter whether we spend it on computer science or economics or on sociology? Or is it just magic what we invest in? Should we spend on physics or uh, semiconductors, right? So let's, let's be a bit more explicit. Here's what not to do. This is what the Europeans did. They did a study of the Eco European Research Council. And so what they did was they commissioned people to figure out whether they did a good job or not. And guess what? When the ERC commissioned a study to find out whether they did a good job, just about everything they did was fantastic. Major breakthroughs, major scientific advances. Uh, Shannon, how much do you believe a, a commission study on what kind of job you did? And the question again? How much do you believe a, a study that uh, someone commissions to tell you whether you did a good job or not? Mm, maybe 75%. <laughs> I don't know if I trust it all the way completely, but. What do you think, Han? Uh, myself or believe in. What do you think that, so the natural reaction, right? Mm -hmm. When you're trying to figure out the impact of research, is to commission a study. So they commissioned a study. They found just about everything they did was fantastic. Do, do, I, do I believe in it? Do you believe it? To be honest, no. No, 
That's right. Right? Because first of all, there's this thing called selection bias, right? Where you're, you're only seeing stuff that got finished. And secondly, everyone has every incentive to say you did a wonderful job. So when your spouse comes home and says, you know, did you do a good job today? Of course I did, right? Ask anyone, right? How about this? Another way of doing it is to uh, have academic rankings like Times Higher Education or the Shanghai. Mary Ellen, what do you think of the academic rankings to figure out whether science has been done well? Uh, well, I'd have to sort of do a crosswalk, crosswalk between what the rankings are actually measuring and whether that would impact, I guess, the si efficacy of the science. Right. And if you go and take a look at these things, they're pretty ad hoc. They just count stuff. So, you know, if you count, one of the challenges that happens is, you know, if you just count the number of Nobel laureates or the number of this, what ends up happening is uh, universities literally combine to go up in the rankings. So I could go on. I could talk a lot about the um, the impact, you know, what the research excellence framework in the UK did, which was nuts. You just had individual panels get together to say we did great stuff. It cost 250 million pounds to to get them to get get together. Or you could do what they did for the uh, stimulus funding in the United States. This is stupidity is not unique to Europe and the UK. Uh, indeed, the, there was a bunch of manual reporting uh, and masses of universities got together and did all this reporting that was going to be able to be used. Uh, if you go on to federalreporting.gov, that's the result of all of that effort. It no longer exists. So what are we going to do? I'm going to talk about a data set that we built, Matt's been part of this, which is called, uh, we started it in response to the ARA uh, in 2009, which said, let's follow the people. They're the ones who produce science and teams of people and track their output. And we can look at their publications, their patents, we can look at their placement, we can look at the firms they start up and all kinds of stuff. So 13 years later, that infrastructure has been built. I'm going to point you to the infrastructure at the end. But Daniel asked me to talk about the nature piece that we just did. So I'm going to talk about that in the context of understanding people. Okay. So what we got, the underlying infrastructure looks at individuals, all individuals who are funded on research grants. And we've been working with this data for a long time. Um, and one of the things that we noticed when we looked at the data is if you just look at individuals, this is a well-known fact, apparently, women publish less than men. And it's across uh, career stage, across country, across field. They just publish less than men. Uh, and they patent less than men. So why? what could be the reason? Well, they could be less productive inherently. If you hire a woman, she's just not going to do as good a job. Uh, they've got family responsibilities, their career absences. It might be that they're in different positions. They choose different positions. But a very intriguing possibility came up as we were talking about this. And I actually woke up in the middle of the night and thought, this, this is a Rosalind Franklin problem. So who knows who Rosalind Franklin was? Let me pick on someone else. So Sarah Lafia, who's Rosalind Franklin? I think she was part of the team with Watson and Crick that contributed to the discovery of the nucleotide. Uh, That's but right. She didn't receive any credit for that discovery. That's right. So Crick and Watson, uh, you know, published a paper in Nature that said 
you know, here's the double helix for DNA. Rosalind Franklin found it, but she wasn't named on the paper. So another possibility is that women are doing the work, but they're not being named on the papers. Right now, and it may be the same for blacks, for non-native speakers, for immigrants, for first gen. So how do we find out who is not named? Right, because if we only look at papers, we're only going to see people who are named. How do you find out who is not named? Okay, so why does it matter? Why do we care if, if people aren't named? You know, life isn't fair, so why do, we, why do we care? Well, part of the reason that we care is we want the best people possible to be doing science. If you don't attract people like you, right, the whole reason that this program exists is to get junior people to come in and think about science problems. We want to have the talent pool. But if, Elena, you look at a woman and you see they're not as likely to get credit, you might exit. You might say, this is not for me. I'm going into the private sector. I'm going to do something else. That's a problem because if you have, does that make sense, Elena? Yes. Okay. So, you know, that's why we should care. We should also care about having diverse teams because part of the deal here and part of the reason I'm trying to get you to talk is if you sit back in your career and sit, don't respond and don't ask questions, you're gonna get marginalized. So one of the things you need to be thinking about is how to speak up, right? So Hung Yu, does that make sense? Yes, as I'm uh, speaking up now. <laughs> now you're speaking up, right? right. You've gotta learn, so, uh, and because if you don't speak up, you're not gonna get credit and we need to hear different voices to innovate. So it's really important, not because it's not fair, but we need it for science. Okay. So one of the things NSF has really pushed for is trying to figure out why we have the missing billion, millions. Part of it may be that their voices aren't heard. Okay. So here's the problem. How do you find out who's not there? Now, has anyone seen this picture before? Okay, Han, what's the story here? Thank you for speaking up. There you go. You've learned lesson number one. <laughs> Thank you. So <clears throat> I saw this uh, figure like when I was in a uh, computational research integrity conference. Like there's a story behind it is uh, in the World War II, I think, yes. or World War One. So that there. Uh, engineers are uh, trying to want to enhance the airplane so that the plates of uh, the of uh, the fighters can come back because they have the craft look at how, how they want to examine how the craft looks like after the war and they want to check how to enhance it. And uh, some engineers say we should enhance where the uh, the holes are because uh, the uh, because the bullets hit the host so that we need to enhance those holes so that they won't be uh, they won't be attacked again. But That's another, right. another engineer say, no, we shouldn't because uh, those holes doesn't matter because the planes come back and the fighters were safe. We need to enhance where there are no bullets so that uh, if the bullets uh, hit the plane and they can still come back. That is brilliant. That is absolutely perfect. So the thing is, is to understand the data generating process. There's a selection bias. If you use the data to tell you where to reinforce the planes, it's going to tell you actually to reinforce it at the wrong place because those are the planes that came back, as Han said. What you're really interested in is the planes that didn't come back. So this is the same problem. What we need to understand is who is missing. 
So if we only look at planes that come back, we're not seeing the planes that got shot down, the ones that didn't come back. If we only look at people who author, we're not seeing the people who didn't author. We're missing the Rosalind Franklins. So how are we gonna do this? Well, this is the Nature paper. So uh, feel free to tweet it out. Uh, it, it's, it's actually uh, already, it's had almost 50,000 downloads, which to me is just amazing. Um, but, you know, here's what we wanna do. We want to think through what the process is and we wanna build a data infrastructure around it. So here's the basic idea. As I said, when you spend money on science, it doesn't automatically turn into publications. What it is, we need to look at the people and the institutions and the teams. How are we gonna construct that? That's what produces the science. That's the scientific production function. And then the uh, ideas encapsulated in, in, in patents and publications are what come out of that. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna follow the money. So when a grant is made, for example, to Daniel at uh, Syracuse, a code gets created. Even though he's the PI, he's not doing all the work. Well, maybe he is, but I expect he's got people working with him on producing this. Every single payment that is made is tracked through the human resource uh, system at Syracuse. So every check that gets cut, every pay period, that shows up. So I can know who worked on this grant by looking at the payroll records. I can also see who are the vendors because if he purchased any equipment, that shows up in a P card. So I have transaction data on all the people who worked on all the grants uh, in contributing universities, okay? So uh, this uh, institute got established at the University of Michigan. There are 118 campuses. Syracuse is not one of them, Daniel, so you should beat on Syracuse. Um, and now you have massive amounts of information about all the people who worked on the contributing universities. So what we have to do is to figure out we have to construct measures of research teams based on the projects they worked on, which is administrative records. It's not surveys. You're not gonna be able to get it through surveys. And then what I can see is I can see the publications and patents that were produced by the teams. And then I can see uh, if Daniel is cited as an author, whether his, who is cited on his team, and then figure out who gets it attributed. Does that make sense? Now I have three different measures. We're gonna say of Daniel's team, were they ever cited out on a paper? Then the second measure is for all the papers that were coming out of the lab, how many of those were individuals uh, named on, and then how many were named on the high impact uh, publications, the ones that got lots of citations. So thinking through Rosalind Franklin. Does that make sense? Uh, who can I pick on? Uh, Yi, Yi Xiang. Does that make sense? Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I guess, yes. Okay, Soda, you're good. Lucas? Yes, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I have yeah. a question if I could. Oh. Sure, great. Yes, please speak up. How do you uh, choose the institutions to participate? Do they all have to be public institutions or are there some private in there as well? Great question. Uh, they choose to come in. So there's a selection bias, of course, in the institutions. Um, there has been a massive outreach to all the universities and they are coming in more and more. Uh, but they have, uh, if you go on to the website, it's iris.is, 
iris.isr.umich.edu and I'll provide you information about that. There's only bias to the extent that teams operate differently in different institutions. So that's your question about private versus public, but there's a mix of private, public, land grant, non-land grant, region, and so on. Um, the other thing that we did was at the request of nature is we uh, asked, we did a survey of the allocation of scientific credit. So this goes down to who gets scientific credit. So, and uh, Daniel, I see I'm running a little bit out of time. Is it okay to run a little bit over? Yeah, just okay. keep, keep going. No okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to we'll look at all the individuals who show up on those grants. And then we look at all the patents and publications that are generated and figure out uh, uh, whether people are named. Okay. And you could go and read the paper. There's lots of information in the supplemental materials and so on. So what's the headline here? Well, um, women, the headline story is we can control for all kinds of things. We can control for institution. We can control for field. We can control for uh, a size of team. We can control for um, where they are in academic status, whether they're graduate students, postdocs, or so on. Women are 5% less likely to be named. The, the, raw, the raw number is men are 20% uh, likely to be named. Women are about half that. But part of that is because there are more women in junior positions than senior positions. Once you control for uh, women being less likely to be faculty, the, 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 the effect is about 5% less, but it's strongly statistically significant. For graduate students, it's less as well. Uh, if you look at the gap between men and women on, uh, this is ever named. The second measure is of all the potential papers, are you named or not? There's a 13% gap between men and women on an article, 58% on a patent. For high impact papers, so the Rosalind Franklin example, the higher the impact of the paper, the less likely they are to be named. This is kind of the, the clearest picture, I think. Uh, down here, this is the proportion of women in the different career fields, uh, sorry, uh, stages of the career. So uh, there are fewer women faculty. There are more women in the research staff. So this goes 20% to 70%. And this is the potential authorships. This is the actual authorships. Obviously, faculty produce more publications than undergraduates. If the share of women was equal, you would expect those bubbles to be on the 45 degree line. You would expect women faculty to have the same share of actual authorships as potential authorships. In every stage of the career, women are less likely to be named an author than men. Well, what about by research field? So here, physical sciences, there are fewer women in the physical sciences, engineering and, and geosciences than there are in psychology, health, uh, social sciences. So if you just look at the differences between potential and actual authorships, Regardless of field, women are less likely to be named. They're not on the 45 degree line. What about just straight summary statistics when you control? Um, and this is looking for splitting it out by publications and patents. So this is the probability that you're named on any paper uh, produced by the team if you're female and male. So this is individual level of things. You can control for 
uh, with no controls, this is the, the gross difference. We have data because one of the questions was, well, maybe women aren't working as much. Well, we can control because of the data infrastructure. We know how many days they're working on each grant because uh, they get paid based on the number of days. We know the job title, we know the field, and we can have controls for each research team. So that gap is systematically different. Then the last measure is high impact. Uh, and you can see that the greater the impact on publications of a publication, the less likely a woman is to be named. So when we did this, Nature came back and said, look, these are really important results. We expect it to have a big impact, but you know, you can't just use one source of data. Go ahead and do a, a, a survey. So we did, we spent uh, a lot of time, uh, my co-author, Britta Glennon, uh, spent a lot of time developing the survey. And we asked people who, why they were excluded. If, and, and you see this notion sorry. of being, sorry, Julia, go ahead. Yeah. I, have, I do have one question, quick question. Sure, sure, sure. So, so uh, in the data that you record, uh, you uh, have the record of who works on what, but uh, who, who works for the project and the gender, but do you have, uh, what exactly they do? Maybe they do different things. Some people do more technical stuff. Some people do writing, but will the, that affect if they are uh, named by the PI in the paper? I'm, this is my question. Fant Boy, Han, you are fantastic. I'm just telling you, you should talk to me afterwards. Um, but that was also one of the questions and you can't get that from the data. So that was the question that we asked in the survey which I'm setting up right now. So the, um, the, there turns out a, a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, Amy Brandt um, and Laurel Hake and others developed this notion of what are the tasks in a paper? There's a, <clears throat> a paper they wrote called Project Credit. So what we did was we asked why people, first of all, we asked why they were excluded, but then we asked, uh, let me go actually to the next question to answer Han. When you break down the sources of activity that are part of making a paper. So if you take a look, so we took the project quest credit questions uh, did you conceptualize? Did you curate data? Did you do the analysis? Did you do, uh, did you get the money? Uh, did you do the investigation? Did you do the methodology? These are all the ways you can contribute to the paper. So what happened here is that in every area except writing software, women reported doing more than men. And you can take a look at, at, at the paper. Then we asked uh, for more detail on that and you can take a look at the survey. We asked, why did you think you were excluded? And contrary to what the literature said, which is odd, it, women have family responsibilities. Uh, women were much more likely to say they were excluded, that their voices were not heard. So part of, again, the reason I'm picking on you is I didn't push to be listed as an author. So these were the, what they wrote. Um, one, they didn't speak up. That's, that was the number one thing. They, they did not speak up. They didn't uh, ask, they didn't push. Another one was power dynamics. This came up a lot, which is the, the PI, it controls a lot and would allocate as reward and punishment. This came up for both men and women, but it came up more for men than for women. And it has uh, big consequences. So uh, I'm going to, I'm running out of time at this point, but uh, why does all of this matter? So what we found was, yeah, there are differences. And given that, um, uh, so much work is now being done by teams. 
uh, not individuals, understanding how to manage big science, how to manage teams of people is not something we're trained to do. So, you know, I don't think that this indicates, oh, there are a bunch of real jerks. I mean, there may be one or two real jerks, but it really represents, you know, we're also focused just on doing the science. We forget to communicate. We forget to ask people who might be quiet, who don't speak English, who might be non-native speakers of English, or who are conditioned to stand back, as often women are, you know, you get yelled at for being bossy if you speak up too much or, you know, so uh, first generation students, non-native uh, speakers, immigrants who are not used to the culture, if they don't speak up, we as principal investigators are not trained to get people to speak up, right? So it's awkward. So Mary Ellen, when I pick on you, what's your first reaction? Your first reaction is, ah! right? Is that correct? When when you pick on me, um, yeah. I don't, well, I, I like engaging, so it's okay. It's challenging. But I think in my experience, you just, uh, I got, um, I, I got kind of iced out of an idea I had for an internal grant just by some uh, someone not returning my emails and then they took credit, put their name on the, it was a small amount of internal award, but yeah, just not, just kind of icing you out of a partnership is common when people wanted to take the credit. Yeah. Yeah. So this resonates, right? Oh yeah. How about you, Li Shen? Does this resonate with you? Oh, not really. Okay. Uh, Chantal. Yeah, somewhat. I think my situation is a little bit different. Um, I posted a comment about that in the chat, but it resonates. Juven? 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 I'm sorry. Um, Juven. Juven, sorry. Yeah, it also resonates. Okay. So, you know, there are things that could be done. Uh, you could train PIs, you could get people to speak up, learn, uh, and take a look at project credit. Find out whether this happens more generally. We chose women because there are more women. It's, you run into small sense cell sizes. So one of the things you might want to think about, and I'm conscious of time, but what kind of research opportunities are there? The, Iris data are available. You could look at differences by race, ethnicity. You could look at outcomes. How does that affect student placement? Publications are a big signal in academia, uh, but so are placements. Uh, so there's lots of uh, information that could be done here. As I said before, we, we need this kind of work done uh, for the missing millions. Um, there's been uh, a lot of NSF funded research that has been um, using this kind of data, the Irish Eumetrics data, many, many operation uh, things that can be done. There's over 450 researchers that have worked with the data in different places. Uh, and you can do a lot. You don't just have to look at papers and publications. You can look at the structure of teams, uh, how to improve outcomes, and, uh, and there are many, many different options there. Uh, I should be remiss if I missed out talking about my co-authors. Uh, there they are. And that's, you can reach me by email. Uh, I'm not very active on Twitter, but uh, I am more active on LinkedIn. So you can reach me in those ways. So let me stop there. Thank you so much, Julia. And let's give her a round of applause. You achieve a milestone where we see all the faces of all the students at once. So that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy. Yes. And remember to speak up. And yes. you, it really is. It, this uh, data science is a team sport, and everyone needs to participate, right? So we really need, and seeing people's faces and engaging is a, a very important part of this so yes 
And I know that Soda she has her camera on all the time, but she's in a in a difficult situation. So I just want her to I want to uh, excuse her. This is uh this is rare. So yeah, but please if you have any questions, Tom is here and he, I'm thinking like you know, a couple of like five, ten minutes of questions. I think it should be fine if Tom uh great. So he says yes. So please uh, go ahead, ask away. Unmute yourself. Speak Eric up. Charis, I'll pick on Eric. Eric, do you have any questions? I'm just trying to digest it all. I mean, more of my questions were on the uh, the details of the data, how it you selected the um, institutions to participate. I guess maybe the question is, as so I'm at Iowa State University, uh, assuming my institution contributes to the, the IRS project, am I able to go in and explore my own my own data or? Um, how is the data presented on the website? That's a great question. Uh, so the micro data, so I, I'm not sure if Iowa State is part of it. Matt, maybe you can answer that question, but if no, it's not, not the you should get Iowa State to join. Uh, each participating institution, their researchers can come in and work with their data. Now your names are, just to be clear, are not on, in the data set. They are all de-identified as an IRB approved depository. Mm -hmm. Individual level re results are not reported. It is um, it is de-identified and you have to sign away your life to uh, say that you're not going to try and re-identify. But yes, Iowa State, when it joins, uh, their researchers can come in and do analysis and compare it to similar institutions. And the, the university gets uh, reports about, you know, what their impact is uh, using actual information about uh, individuals. Mary Ellen and then Sarah. Uh, I'm sort of having second thoughts about my question, but I'll, I'll go ahead and be brave and ask it anyway. I. Uh, That's right. I, uh, yeah. If I... That's absolutely really important. Go ahead. Okay. So, and I got to apologize because I feel like I've been asking the same question in different versions to everybody this week, but it's about the role of libraries in science because as scholarly communication is evolving and computing intensive research methodologies are shifting the way that science is done and communicated, the role of libraries is... Um, somewhat undervalued and I wonder if there's a gender component to that but there, there's a, also a lot of other factors but because I just think that some people don't quite understand the role of information science and data science so, so to speak so uh, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on the role of libraries uh, in general just just any anything that resonates with you about that stream of consciousness would be great well that was actually uh, I I'd ask Daniel which what, what he would like me to talk about. I have this whole other uh, stream of activities called Rich Context, which looks uses uh, the very important work that libraries do and data science to understand uh, what data are used to answer what questions. And so I'm going to put that in the chat. And uh, there it is. Uh, but be happy to, to chat to you about what we're doing. That's a very important question. And the answer is libraries are very important. The inf it's information science. And it's very important. Thank you. So, thanks. Sarah. Hi, thank you so much. And thanks for getting us all engaged. I feel energized by your talk. Good. Um, <laughs> I have a very general, uh, just maybe thing you could ask to, uh, or something I wanted to ask you to comment on, which is that, um, some of us this week have been exploring a really excellent data set that uh, both uh, Daniel and Stephen David, who's another organizer, have made available on mentorship. And I was curious if you see any possibility of extending some of this work, specifically looking at mentorship dynamics, um, how that might have any connection to the, the talk that you just shared. Okay, so I'm an economist. So I think a lot about evaluating the impact of interventions. Right? So um, what that means is if you think about a theory of change, you think about 
uh, spending money on an activity like mentorship and then evaluating the impact relative to a counterfactual. So there's uh, actually been, um, there was a very good piece. There was a mentorship activity in the field of economics called Cement. Uh, and there was uh, an evaluation done of it. Uh, and I can put that in the chat in just a minute. And it was done by Janet Curry uh, and others. Uh, let me just find it and I'll put it in the chat. I guess, but, so but going to this, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. go ahead. Just just quickly comment that I don't think we can we could use if we, if we have access to to the data that you use, we cannot dis we cannot uh, disidentify and link it to mentorship. So that we no no, we but you would you would have uh, you could um, you have an intervention, right? So you. That is described, you could look at all the um, investments that included mentorship because there'll be some description of that in the grant abstract. It will say, this is about mentorship. And then you would, uh, obviously you can't do, do a randomized control trial, but you can do propensity score matching. Uh, so we have a whole slew of techniques to be able to match things. In fact, uh, the the um, this last round of Nobel laureates, Josh Angrist um, and Guido Imbens got the Nobel Prize for figuring out how to compare the impact of interventions by controlling for um, observable characteristics. It's propensity score matching was what they were most famous for. But I, obviously you wouldn't identify, but what you do is you'd compare the publication and patents and placements of people like you who were involved in a mentorship program relative to people who weren't controlling for as many observable characteristics as you've got. So if you take a look at uh, the, the Nobel Prize uh, for a description of this, it's Guido Embens and Josh Angrist um, and the propensity score matching. But that's exactly what we mean by a science of science. What's the impact of an intervention relative to the counterfactual? And so, yeah. Do you have a question, Mary, or is that it might be remnant a residual. of your residual? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? Well, we're at the hour. So um, you all know how to reach me. I and uh, I see all your questions in the chat. Daniel's going to send them to me, so I'll have some reference to look at. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, it's a beautiful array of cameras on that I see. Thank you for that for makes me very this. happy. Okay. Yes, and, and and shaking the entire summer school. So let's thank Julia for her time, sharing Bye, this guys. amazing research, and and changing her presentation last minute due to my request. Uh, thank you.